Hello everyone and welcome to the Indie Plus Pound Game Night. This is the second panel held on our March, our monthly Game Night Pound Game Night uh, YouTube and Hangouts on Air. This panel will be discussing game design contest. Now that's a, a, a contest that where someone has to take uh, just a few ideas and, and some ingredients and others, and we'll talk a little bit more specifically about it, and then within a time period, make a tabletop role-playing game. Uh, the blurb that we had about this is making games against the clock is fun, but does it produce anything worthwhile? <laughs> is sleep deprivation and caffeine the recipe for genius or self-delusion? <laughs> We discuss the best and worst of RPG game design contests, their role in the creative spark, and whether anything worth publishing ever comes out of them. And I already know the answer to that one, but we'll talk about it anyway. I have three wonderful guests, experts uh, who have been part of a number of cool game design contests. And we'll start alphabetically, because that's the most egalitarian concept I could come up with, uh, with this table that I rolled on earlier. Andy Kitkowski took on administration of Iron Game Chef for a few years. So. And he's been working with the folks of 1km, 1kt.net to build an oasis of new game ideas. He also ran the 24-hour RPG challenge for several years. Uh, he likes uh, playing action-y RPGs with wonderful people and sometimes translates and shares RPGs from Japan. Hey, Andy, how are you, sir? Good, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for coming on. Uh, next, we have a veteran from the panels that I host. Um, I, I would call her a superstar, really. It's Emily Kerboss, who's an independent game designer and publisher from Massachusetts. She founded the regional Jiffy Con. I didn't know that. That is so cool. Yeah. And uh, published a zine RPG, uh, which was uh, RPG equals role-playing girl, which has been succeeded by any award-winning blog, Gaming as Women. Gaming oh, Gaming as, as Women. women. Yes. Yes. It, Emily ran the RPG Solitaire Challenge in January 2011, which started on 1-1-2011. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And has taken part in game design contests going back to the second Iron Game Chef on the Forge, which is uh, now gone uh, close down, but that's indie-rpgs.com. And the theme with that was Simulationist. And that was back in 2003. Some of you watching this on YouTube may not have even been born when Emily was doing <laughs> these contests. Although if you are, there could be some, some blue words from Andy, just so you know. <laughs> uh, and then she, she's done game design contests through the, the current shortest month, longest game design calendar. It's going on right now. That's going on right now. As this is being recorded, that's shortest month, longest game design cal challenge, and I will have a link to that because it's a really long URL. <laughs> and then last but not least, we have... I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, we have Mike Holmes, who ran the very first Iron Game Chef competitions on the Forge based on ideas that he found there, because he steals stuff. <laughs> He's the co-author of Universe Universalis. It's not Universalis. Uh, uh, Arnold Cassell, it is not Universalis. You're wrong. <laughs> uh, Mike has worked with numerous RPG designers on their projects. Welcome to the panel, Mike. Uh, thanks for having me. Great, great. Oh, so excited to have you guys on. So, um, first of all, let's kind of lay the the design. Let's, let's talk about where this came from. Like, I'm sure there are other RPG game design concepts, so we'll work with our microcosm and kind of define it so that we know what, everyone knows what we're talking about. So, Mike, talk about Iron G and where, what the heck is this thing? Well, uh, it was uh, actually a concept that had been floated around on the Forge. Uh, somebody had gotten the idea actually over on Gaming Outpost, Prior to the forge, uh, I think it was Jared Sorensen and/or Luke Crane or, uh, or Clinton. Clinton, Clinton, yeah, Clinton Nixon, right? I, I'm not sure exactly who had the idea originally. In fact, they disavow ever having had the idea. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure I got it from somebody. Like you say, I, I don't make stuff; I just steal. So, um, uh, you know, my part of it was merely saying, "Well, maybe this would be a good idea." Maybe we could get something out of this. Maybe it would be fun, interesting, I don't know what. And I uh, actually did it. Um, uh, the first year, and, and maybe unfortunately, um, you know, this was during the time when GNS was a big thing over on the Forge. Oh, yeah. Um, we, I, you know, I decided to do them. Uh, the first one is gameism. The one, second one is simulationism. The third one is um, narrativism. Uh, probably not the best idea for uh, starting these things up. But, I, you know, 
it was a new idea, and I just had to, you know... It was dark time. times, my friend. <laughs> dark times. <laughs> and, 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 I mean, and the funny part about it was I was a big fan of Iron Games, or uh, Iron Chef, the TV show, <laughs> and um, I really liked the format, and, uh, you know, and goofily, when I was running it, would always pretend to be the chairman, and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and the, whole, the whole idea of ingredients came out of the, you know, Iron Chef concept. Um, and uh, so that's, that's where it all comes from. I mean, it was just... Uh, you know, and, and uh, did I think it through when uh, when I, we uh, started out doing it? No, not really. It's just like, you know, I thought, hey, we've got a lot of creative people on this site. They have a lot of interesting ideas. Let's see what happens. Board at work, probably a factor. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah let's see what happens. <laughs> you know, we were doing a lot of experimenting back then, and so, you know, what, you know this is just to add something to the mix, you know. Something exciting, hopefully, and it it it, it was um, the um, the the experiment was um, it, you know it started out pretty slow with the first year. We only had twelve completed entries, um, but uh, you know, soon it became uh, a pretty big thing. A lot of people getting involved in a lot of completed entries, and uh, um, and, uh, and and I was having a lot of fun running it. Frankly, it was a lot of work, but. Uh, it was uh, a good time, and um, and and the results were interesting. You know, um, they weren't brilliant necessarily, or I mean, some bits and pieces here certainly were. But yeah, obviously, you can only get so much done in such a time. And uh, but it was great to see what people could do in that short a time. Now, uh, just to talk a little more specifically about Iron GM, you. What about the Iron Chef? Did you take into Iron GM? Like a little, little bit of the structure. There's something to do with like words or random. Well, yeah, it, 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 in a lot of the contests that are out there, right? The, the ingredients again. Um, in in Iron Chef, the team, uh, one specific ingredient that uh, is is the format for the show that all the chefs have to work with to create. I thought, you know, I can't just have one. That's not going to be enough. So I went with four. Um, uh, different words, you know, try to pick things that were kind of generic, kind of um, uh, uh, that that anybody could kind of make a, a number of different things out of. I thought, and um, uh, and then have an overall constraint, uh, like I said, for the GNS limitations that we had on the first three. So, um, uh, you know, that and the like you said, the goofy pretending to be the. Uh, um, the chairman <laughs> and speaking in the chairman's voice all the time as we went through the whole thing. It, 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 you know, that actually, it, it, that's a fun part of the show and it was a fun part of running the contest was, you know, having that persona and, um, uh, and you know, kind of making fun of uh, the parallels between what's going on and comparing the, you know, the, it, 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 the parallels are pretty solid actually in a lot of ways. Making a role playing game is a lot like cooking a dish, a rather grandiose dish. Um, so it all seemed to make sense at the time. Very cool. Uh, so Andy, you took over RNGM, but one of the other things that you have been involved with running is the 24-hour RPG challenge. Mm -hmm. what, what's, what's that? Uh, again, uh, just like Mike standing on the backs of giants, both uh, the stuff that I picked up with the uh, Iron GM or Game Chef from uh, after I, I looked up, uh, I think I, I chose Game Chef uh, on a on a series of factors. Most of them being uh, Game Chef was the URL that was available for for, for purchase. Um, but uh, so that I, I I picked up from Mike Azar Ring with the twenty four hour RPG challenge as well. Um, I was not the first one uh, to to do that. It was actually uh, Phil Reed. Um, designer, he was really prolific in the early eras of PDF publishing and, and D20 and stuff like that. He he wrote a couple of games. I think one of them is called Versus Monsters that's uh, still available out there. Uh, very simple game. But he he at one point uh, got inspired by the tw uh, and and him as well borrowed from the 24-hour comic project, where the idea was uh, uh, 24 hours, 24 pages of comics. Uh, get a bunch of comic artists together and, and everyone does their own thing for 24 hours and then releases it you know, or finishes up when they're done. Uh, that's a contest that still goes on. Even local comic stores are, uh, have a 24-hour have a comics night. Um, and, Scott uh, McCloud, the comic writer, uh, I think originated that or was one oh, he of did that? who started that. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I didn't know the cool. history behind it. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, the understanding comics dude and all. But yeah, so, so exactly. uh, Phil Reed said, hey, uh, why don't we do this for RPGs? And um, uh, he designed. He had the contest, which was uh, write a game, a 24-page game, uh, in one evening, and um, 
from that point on, uh, yeah, the, he, he did it for just a one-time thing and just kind of never went anywhere. And I thought, hey, this is kind of cool. I did it myself. And then um, uh, said this is interesting enough that I, you know, again, the URL was available. Uh, and I was kind of bored at work at the time. So I picked it up and started running with it. Um, mostly uh, just, uh, I started off, I think, with a 24-page thing. But I, I think I dropped that eventually uh, and just said, just, you know, 24 hours, make a game. Uh, no, no theme, no whatever. Just you, you, you can't have had written stuff in the background or whatever. You had to go in it fresh. You could have had ideas, but you can't you know, pull on your old Microsoft Doc text or anything like that. Um, and and yeah, you mentioned the, the crossover with one uh, K and one KT. That's a uh, uh, the size one thousand typewriters, one thousand monkeys. Uh, the yeah, the, the, the famous quote. Um, uh, a friend emerged from that scene and said, hey, I've got this website for free RPGs that people want to host. Why don't we host them there? And so I just started shuffling them over there to be sort of archived. Um, and now they sort of host all those, uh, all the games over there. Uh, so, yeah, that's... Uh, but I, I, uh, now, both of the contests I've, I've since uh, uh, relinquished to other people. 24-hour RPG went to Steve and... Uh, Steve Segetti and Jason Morningstar, um, mm -hmm. who I think are still running it to this day. And uh, Game Chef is now uh, in the hands of Jonathan Walton, who I think has again passed on further. So, oh wow, I'm glad you said further because you made me scared. I didn't know. <laughs> pass on, that would be sad. Because he messaged me on Google Plus earlier today. Uh, Emily Care Boss, tell me a little bit about the um, RPG Solitaire Challenge. What, what was that? Um, I sort of had it in the back of my mind. Uh, just this idea about writing. So role-playing games that you could play just one person, you, not even a GM and you, but just one person. And um, and over the years, I'd taken a part in uh, Iron Game Chef several times and uh, had a really good time. And uh, so when the first day of the first year of the new millennia started, I was thinking, one, 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 wait a minute, there's an opportunity here for something fun. So um, I decided t uh, to just do sort of at the spur of the moment actually at the last minute I thought of the idea of, of doing this contest and um, and started it and, and and did it so it was um, actually much more successful than I thought there was like 30 entries um, some people give multiple entries and um, and which contrary to expectations because when you say the concept a one-person role-playing game usually people go well, how is that a role-playing game or you can't do that so um, it was a lot of fun to be able to have something that really kind of brought a lot of different um, creative minds to something that might have been poo-pooed otherwise. Yeah, I was baffled by it, but it was really awesome to watch people pull it through, yeah. It was a, a serious um, design constraint. Uh, and then we'll probably talk more about types of challenges and ingredients, but, you, you, you know, I, I always loved the ingredients for Iron Game Chef, and... and Really, they've been very essential for me in how, when I've taken part in the game uh, contest, they've really made me think about something that, that gave me a game idea. So I was always grateful to have something there. Um, and it's been neat to see how they change over time, too. Um, so what we did in uh, the RPG Solitaire Challenge was to have different ideas that the various judges were interested in looking at. Um, I had one that was uh, pencil and paper. So you played the game with nothing but a pencil and or something to write with in a piece of paper, um, so that it could be very portable. And there were quite a few uh, entries, and, and uh, I, I liked those because a lot of them were very short, so that was easy to judge. And uh, <laughs> and there was there was a bunch of different things that the four judges brought. So that was um, that was a neat aspect of it. We had a lot of variety because people were looking for different things in the games. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, that was that was an exciting actually completed the game in that that was yes. not very not very good. Um, <laughs> so prior to the panel, I did put out a, a kind of wide band cast requesting questions because I'm not that smart and I stand on the backs of giants like many other people on the panel. Uh, so here are some of the questions. And also, if you're watching this live, the Hangout on Air, through the Indie Plus, uh, Google Plus page, uh, we are watching that like a hawk. So if you have questions to give us, uh, feed that, and I'll try to slide it in here. But uh, barring that, first I'll start off with Josh Roby had a question. Are design contests typically... Are design contests 
typically about producing a game that can be played by others? Or are they more focused on getting an idea out of your brain and clearing the hurdle of getting an idea on paper? Are they about turning out games or turning out game designers? Hmm. Um, that's a very interesting question. I, that, that was actually, I, I kind of looked at the list of questions we had, uh, and that was the one that kind of, uh, that was the big one. That's really the biggest one, in my opinion, because um, honestly, uh, that is the answer to that question is going to be up to the uh, challenge designer. And the, uh, depending on who the challenge designer is uh, and how they formulate the contest, that's going to be the central uh, question and, and really reciprocate and, 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 and you'll, you, basically it's, it's the core of what the contest is. Uh, and, and even as I was looking at that question, I'm like, holy cow, because it made me think about uh, the, the, the way Mike ran things, the way I ran things, the way I saw uh, Jonathan and others, uh, even you know, Jason and, and, and uh, Emily uh, run uh, some, some contests. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's very different. Um, my answer, uh, personally, is uh, it's absolutely, again, and this is my, as a designer of the contest, uh, mine was to get, the, get an idea on paper. Um, there, I saw some things in other questions. So I'll kind of foreshadow here, uh, where people saying, um, uh, you know, how can the, you know, what, what, the games produced and what, how, what, what are their qualifications? How are they good games if, if they follow a contest format, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, the most important part of the of the game design process being feedback, blah 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 blah. Uh, for me, my chronic problem has always been lethargy uh, and um, and procrastination. Uh, so I've got all these awesome game ideas up here that never seem to get out on paper because, uh, uh, oh, I'm busy at work. I'm busy at work. That's why I said, you know, I'm playing a three-hour video game marathon or something like that. Uh, so uh, uh, for me, um, the, the breaking of the dam for me was not getting the, a game published. It was getting uh, a game from my head on paper so I could say, look, I finally did something. Uh, and I wanted to encourage that in other people, so that's where I went with my contest. So my thing was not uh, let's let's get something, have a you know whoever what, whoever emerges from this contest is obviously publishable, uh, and let's race it to uh, to get in people's hands and play. It was more like all right, uh, there, we'll we'll judge the results and all that, but anyone who finished it and put their mind on paper and you know and actually did it to to some degree, uh, those, those people are all the winners. That was my thing with it. I'd love to hear uh, what others thought. Yeah, I, I can't even say that I had thought all that through that thoroughly, frankly, when I you know, started doing things. Or rather, uh, you know, my, my whole idea was people are going to take out of it what they're going to take out of it. If a person you know, just needs to get some confidence with doing design, you know, maybe that's what it'll give them, and they'll go on to make something else good at a later date. Um, if a person's got an idea, like Andy says, that they need to get down, maybe this is a chance for them to force themselves to do it. Um, you know, uh, I think you know you can put some parameters in the contest that may affect how people are going to use it, um, what they're going to get out of it. But I think largely that uh, you know it's one of these things where you get out of it what you put into it. So um, um, even from the start, I tried not to promise too much. What the results would be. It was, you know, we're, we're, first off, no prizes. You know, we're not. There's no, you know, there's no real reward. Uh, you know, in terms of it being a contest per se. In fact, calling them contests is almost a misnomer in a lot of ways, because sure, well, you know, we. In fact, using the whole Iron Chef thing as the format was to sort of make it seem kind of facetious that we were going to crown somebody Iron Game Chef. <laughs> Absolutely, right? yeah. You know, and, and you know who the cares? paper crown. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Who cares who wins? Really, you know, uh, you win if you got something good out of it. So really, I wasn't too concerned at the time, at least, with um, uh, what it would produce. I just hope that people would, you know, use it for something that they could get something out of. Emily. Um, well, to follow up on that, I can tell you what I got out of it taking part in it that first time, uh, Mike. Um, uh, Josh mentioned, does it make game designers? And for me, um, taking part in that first contest did that for me. It, it made me feel like not only could I think about games and like games and you know break them apart, I might be able to actually write one. And the feeling of submitting one and then getting your feedback was was like transformational for me. 
because it, it shifted something in my head about my relationship with the games. So that was that was pretty profound. It was a pretty good game too. Oh, yay! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And you know, I keep making iterations of it. someday I'll, I'll land on one. That that's one of the major things that people bring up about these contests is that they don't actually like gel, but. But I've always loved the ideas that I've come up with. And actually, when I did the um, the solitaire game, that yeah. was sort of where I landed in this question what, about what is the final product of the mm -hmm. contest that people are mm -hmm. going to walk away with, was I didn't want to put pressure on people to feel like they had to have a completed game at the end of the contest. Because having done it several times, I knew that you could have a pretty well fleshed out, very strong idea but there's a long process before you're going to be done with it, and even if it's even if the design is like three quarters of the way done. Yeah, you also so have much to more. really love it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You really got to be committed to it, and there's just there's just more in the process. So yeah. for me, the ground rule really was I was we were committing together to make game ideas that you could then do whatever you want with it, and that. And then, I, like, I, I feel the same as you guys, that the most important thing was just the people participating it and in it, having this experience, and then taking from it what they would. Hopefully walking away with a game idea they really loved. And if not, like, you know, Rich, you, 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 you had an idea and you worked with it, and maybe it'll bring you something else someplace along the way, uh, if that's not the game that you love. But, um, but, yeah, for me, one of the big things I wanted to make sure people didn't feel like they had to do was to bring create a polished thing that was... Final, because I feel like the, a contest is a it's a very small period of time, and you know more power to you if you walk away with one, but it's unlikely. So better not just set that expectation at the start. Yeah, very poignant. Hey, we just got a question uh, from people who are watching this live, so I'm gonna try to slide this in. Sorry to to jump scare you here, but uh, <gasps> thanks, Andy. That's what I needed. Yeah. Um, Brent Newell asks. Uh, what turnoffs have you seen in submissions? What causes you to say, uh, no thanks? Well, I'd like to hear Emily's on this because she's freshest uh, from the from the contest design queue. Well, it's an interesting question because, uh, like like you mentioned, Mike, it, it a contest is kind of the wrong word for it. I mean, I I called mine a challenge. The one that Mendel Schmidt Camp is doing right now is a challenge. I feel like that sort of captures the spirit of it. We're not contest, it's not like the, the X Prize or something. There's not a million dollars at the end of this to help you launch your game. It's just you're doing something that you love and uh, creating something. So the the submissions, I feel like they're, you know, I, I feel um, sort of a responsibility to, to do what I can for whatever whatever is given in, you know. And I've in, in RPG Solitaire, I didn't get any that were you know, like, so incomplete that you couldn't even read them, you know. I feel like that's the only thing that would be the, the major barrier, that it just it's incoherent. Um, um, but I think what I was looking for was just to have a, feel like I, the person had communicated to me what the concept was and how it was going to be done. And, um, and that can be hard or easy, you know, depending on who you're communicating to. I was working with a team of three other judges, and you know, it wasn't always it wasn't always easy. Sometimes, sometimes we had to like have a huddle and talk about, okay, what do you think this person meant, and then email with the person so that we could make sure that the communication happened. But I I I'm not familiar with any contest where you just say no. I'm sorry, that doesn't that doesn't fulfill the requirements. But it might have happened. Did it happen to you guys? Well, we had an interesting thing with last year with uh, the Game Chef where uh, there was the use of the uh, ingredient coyote, and there were a lot of people who were, um, it was interesting, were um, complaining that uh, a lot of the Native American themed uh, mm -hmm. games that came out of it were uh, appropriating Amer Native American culture or uh, in other ways inappropriate. And they were, you know, several of the games were suggesting you act like Native Americans and that sort of thing. And uh, it was interesting. Uh, that all said, um, I, I don't think even were particularly a offensive, but uh, the one that came out was uh, Liam's game. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was now. Uh, but uh, which actually was sort of a commentary on that, that exact thing. So... Um, oh, the doggy dog? Is that the one? Yes, right. Oh, yeah. Right, so... Um, uh, kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, and 
uh, you, you run some risks with uh, picking ingredients or something like that, apparently. And uh, people criticized us afterwards, said you guys shouldn't have picked that term uh, for the contest uh, because, you know, you, were, you should have known that would happen. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't think we can be held quite to that standard, uh, unfortunately. You know, obviously there are some terms... I proposed afterwards that we should, you know, take some racially offensive term and throw it out there or something and see what people do with it because, you know, wow. because frankly, um, it's up to the designers themselves, obviously, to, to make something good or bad out of it, whatever happens. And, um, you're, you know, um, I don't think you can hold the judges uh, responsible for that. But... Um, it was at least a little bit controversial this last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only um, the only thing the uh, turnoff um, is basically when an asshole creates a, a, a like a basically a, a piece of art, um, basically something like just just uh, offensive or dumb or or something like that. Uh, knowing that they're doing it at the time, not like not like uh, you know someone from uh, uh, Denmark. Uh, creating a game about Native Americans and 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 not understanding cultural appropriation. I'm, I'm thinking more like you know someone's like, for example, in the 24 uh, hour contest, I got a submission for a game called Bobby is Special, and you know it's like seven pages long and inside. Uh, uh, I I don't have anything bad against the person who made it. It's been years. I'm wondering. I'm I'm actually wondering who who did it. So if you're out there, let me know. I'm just curious. But it was basically a, an exercise for about 14 pages where someone was just like. It had one die roll in it. It was like basically like yeah, if you and just using words for like you know mentally dis disabled, mm. you know, retard. They had this chart of like one to ten of like how how mentally uh, uh, unstable or, or, or um how uh, mentally deficient you were, and and, and it was you know it's kind of horrifying at the time. It was probably it was probably a cathartic exercise for the person, but I was just like, really, you're gonna you're you're gonna submit this and go like oh no, I, I was making a game. You know, it's, it, I know shock art when I see it. I used to do it myself in, in, in high school and college. Um, and it's, it, you know, if, if you if you do it, say it's shock art, you know, hey, I just had to get it out there. Just just burn it, whatever, I don't care. Uh, but then, you know, if you back it up and say, no, no, it's art. If you think about it, really, no, you should give it a try. You don't understand. Uh, and, yeah, so uh, that's that's the only thing that is a turnoff to me is when, when someone sort of uh, uses the system to, uh, to, 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 to be a, <laughs> an asshole, um, uh, and then and then pretend that they're not. That's my only turn off. Uh, anything else uh, uh, up up to above and beyond that? Well, it's case by case basis, I guess. Nice, nice. Uh, I just want to go back to something real quick. Uh, this has nothing to do with this question, but a couple things that you guys have mentioned is you said that it's really not about uh, like there's no prize, uh, there's no reward. I have to say, and I could be wrong, but if I recall correctly, one of the game chefs, uh, there was a prize which was a katana that shoots a thousand katanas. Whoa. And, Serious? That's and so right, like, I wanted that. <laughs> It sounds okay, like so, something I would have said, but yeah, that's it, it totally idea. was. It was Andy's thing. <laughs> I, I coveted the, the idea of having a katana that would shoot a thousand katanas for nine. I think I, I think I pulled that from RPG Net. There was we there was one of the weapon threads was the most awesome weapon. Someone had like you know a shotgun to shot katanas, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, in, right. in, uh, in the Solitaire Challenge, we did actually have a reward, and uh, it was just for uh, each of the judges to write about the, the games that they'd selected as winners, and actually, uh, I committed the judges to doing that, and it was one step too much, like it was just a, a, a piece of the workload that was beyond what we could complete, so I feel bad that we weren't able to do that, but we did write about each of the games, and it's posted on the blog, so at least everybody got feedback, and, and, uh, and uh, I... I Hope to write more about them in the future. That's an excellent. I think that was part of one of the other questions, since Emily. But if you could go on more about that, the work involved in these contests, uh, yeah. especially if you commit yourself to either one or a group of people reviewing all of them. Can I start? What's the work like? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I, uh, I made you know I started out. I thought, oh hey, I can just judge this all by myself. And first year I got twelve. So, you know, second year was like thirty or something, and like and and I, it almost killed me. Because it was just ridiculous. I mean, you just can't 
do that much work on your own. There's, you know, um, and, and do any kind of, you know, and, and do it with any sort of quality. Um, so uh, it was fortunate. That, that's what burned me out on it, actually. And that's when I handed it over to uh, Andy and others and, uh, and, and uh, let him take it from there because they fixed that then, fortunately, because, yeah, uh, way too much for one person. Yeah, and, and that's Chris Weeks' question, uh, what should someone thinking about hosting or judging or running a design contest know before they jump in? Were there any particular challenges that really shocked you guys when you when you had to do this, other than I've got to write pages and pages of stuff about other people's pages and pages of stuff? I think the reading it is really the big deal. What were you, what were you going to say, Andy? Oh, no, 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 um, the, yeah, the reading it, um, <laughs> I'm kind of a slow reader to begin with, and uh, I think of one of the contests... Uh, people that were making up the rungs uh, to the part where I was like, at this rung, I commit to reading all of them. There was like 16 or something like that, or maybe 32. Uh, and I thought, uh, there was a rung where that I had in one of my first attempts at this. And that rung was like, uh, at least two games submitted were like 40 plus pages. Uh, <laughs> that was a lot of work. Man, that's rough. Um, just a quick, oh, go ahead, Emily. Did you have something? Uh, I was going to say we included a page limit after after having watching all these games go through and and having you know participating in contests where there might be a thirty page or forty page game. When we when I did one, I, I made sure that there was it was either a word count or page limit um, or one or the other because I wanted to make sure that each each game idea would would be manageable to deal with. Right, people expect feedback. I mean that's one of the things that they love about it, and um, and. Uh, you know, reading the games alone and, and you know, and, and, and just giving your impression of them, even short, uh, is a heck of a lot of work. But to actually uh, get to the point where you're giving good feedback, you know, is, you know, obviously a staggering amount of work. And that's when, you know, uh, the, when uh, coming up with the idea of um, having the other designers feedback on each other's work really became an important part of the whole process. And then, Glad those guys figured that out. Yeah, yeah. I started a, a one of the contests. I remember starting actually setting up forums specifically, uh, so that and feedback groups, so um, that it wouldn't just be one of the worries we had was that um, uh, you know, so like Paul Sega would show up and everyone would since they knew that Paul Sega would follow through and it might be interesting, people would like read his stuff, give him feedback, blah, blah, blah. And then some new guy would come in and no one would give that person feedback. So uh, we created like feedback groups and things like that, which worked pretty well for the time. Um, and some people, had, you know, some people showed up anonymously. In fact, I, I did as well, um, you know, taking on a pseudonym or something like that uh, and, and submitting feedback. Um, I took part yeah. in that contest, Andy, if I can What's just that? comment on that. Oh, yeah, absolutely, please. I, I, um, that was one of the ones that I, I uh, wrote in. And, God, I loved those feedback groups because <laughs> that was one where I think there were 90 entries, something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, there were scads of people participating. So by that time, it was huge, and it was easy to feel lost. You know, if it was just you know, uh, a thread of yours on a forum where you were writing about your game, it was very easy to feel like nobody would see it. So I loved having that small group. And, and it made it easier for me, too, to like know that at least there was this group of people that I wanted to make sure I checked in on and said something about everybody's game. And then I could go out and like try and do feedback in other people's groups, but not worry as much. You know, like yeah. all that was just sort of a Benny. Yeah, that's, um, glad, well, I'm glad people, it worked out for people. Um, there was, there's a lot of weird um, social stuff going on, too. Um, it's weird to, when you... When, when you start to create like forums and things like that, and you have to start thinking of the forum as a game itself, um, you you get the things like uh, uh, even with the small feedback groups, you know, someone might be resentful that like uh, I submitted you know a feedback to this person's game, uh, and uh, they said thanks, but then someone else submitted feedback to their game, and that person responded with a little like button at the bottom of their post. Uh, and I didn't get that, and that pissed me off. You know, there, there, there was, you know, little things like that that creeped up too, uh, and that made it made it uh, much more complex, rich at the same time, but but also uh, also complex as well. Um, it was like almost a game in itself. But uh, yeah, that was um, that was an interesting experiment. Uh, that really, that was when we went from the point where it, all of them could have been read and judged by one or two people to, uh, you know, a lot of people were speaking of going. Uh, from from Mike's era going, you know, I wish I had more feedback when it was going on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, so creating, making the contest longer and then adding a feedback cycle helped out with that. Um, ultimately, I think part of a problem was it may, be, may have given people expectations that since they got feedback and since they finished it, then what they have is a playable, publishable thing. Uh, and some people kind of rush to get it out there. Um, but uh, I don't think that was, um, uh, you know, that was sort of a weird side effect that happened. Uh, might have been problematic, but uh, at least people got feedback from their peers and gave feedback. So that was uh, pretty helpful, I think. There was sort of an interesting transition there where it went from like one judge with you, with you Mike, or a couple of judges to being peer reviewed. Um, and that felt good and bad at the same time. Like it was good that it was spread throughout a larger group of people because obviously, you know, as many people as are participating, they can give feedback on other games. But I heard feedback from other folks while it was happening that it was hard to sort of wrangle that many people to actually give the appropriate feedback. So Absolutely. Were, one person might have thought going in, uh, going feedback might be just like one or two sentences for the game. I liked it because of the you know, race statistics. Uh, someone else going like, well, here's four paragraphs for each game. Uh, and then managing those expectations. And then finding the people to, you know, who said, I'm interested, I'll help. And then wrangling them up to actually do it, you know. And then there's a conflict of interest about judging somebody else's games if they're competitors, which you want to not worry about. Mm -hmm. But it's still there, in a sense. And, and people's scales about what's good and what's bad can vary quite a bit. So even if it's not a matter of bias, simply what what you're measuring it against can be really different, so the scoring system can be really wacky. Yeah, um, I definitely noticed everyone has different interests, uh, and I remember things that like Paul Sega was judging as uh, interesting and good to him uh, were you know slightly off from different other people. Ultimately, though, it was sort of a uh, I, I did a roulette wheel. Everyone got a judge. <laughs> yeah, I think at one point I. I I, I, I sort of, uh, you know, I was bored at work is ultimately it, so I was overthinking the thing, so I had like, I made sure that we had three judges, and, and if I knew who the judge was, that um, that I paired them, you know, if someone was really into narrativist games, that I would try to put him with someone that was into, you know, other, you know, fighty games and stuff like that, so we have a, yeah, I overthought it, but ultimately I think it kind of evened out in the end, but uh, it's still a really a big concern. Um, of course, uh, I think someone, uh, there was feedback at the time thinking like, well, if I want to win, I will just. I should just write my game in a way that, that the judge who I know is going to judge me is going to like. Well, are you really going to do that much work for someone else to get a thumbs up at the end of a con? Ooh, you win! <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, but I digress. That's great. Uh, real quick, just want to kind of slide in a comment. This is from uh, someone that's watching the live feed. Uh, Jasic, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to mess this up. I'm a dumb American. Uh, Jet uh, Jasic. Golubiowski says that he wants to say thank you to you guys because um, all of what he's, he's already heard on this encourages him to try this out and join one of these challenges. Awesome. Excellent. That's great. Uh, now we're going to move to the hard part. Ralph Mazza has a question mm -hmm. for you. Ralph. All right. <clears throat> Back crank. Here, box comes, here comes the box text, people. <clears throat> For most people, the most fun and rewarding part of game design is the inspirational spark, the early love affair with design possibilities. The hard part of the game design is the final stages of refining and testing and refining and testing and scrapping and refining when it becomes work and you begin to hate your own creation. Game contests seem backwards in that they provide reward and support for the early stages, which are the fun and easy parts that people don't really need encouragement and support to do, but rarely offer any support or encouragement for the later stages, which is where most projects get abandoned or released half-baked. To what extent has the game design contest mentality created a culture of pursuing the next cool idea rather than one of perfecting the ideas we already have? Yeah. Um... I'll drop my answer and, and and let the other speak very quickly. But that that, that was what I want when it was doing. I was like, it was very poignant. It's a very good question. Uh, and then then I got down to Josh Roby's question, and I'm like, oh, that. Um, uh, as a contest designer, my focus was not on uh, let's make sure that after two weeks we have something that someone can publish and people can buy. Uh, in fact, the the ones that I've seen who rushed that process and and it, it end up with something that was uh, half ready. Um, and, and quickly forgotten. Uh, the, uh, the real thing was to get people right. That was actually, uh, that was actually my harder step 
was to finally crack, to, to, to realize that I am a human being that, that is worth enough to myself to get, a, get words on paper. Uh, so I wanted to encourage that in other people. Uh, the actual publishing process and, and getting a game and getting it nice and, and, and putting it on, on, on IPR or put it in a book and sell it, uh, I said I'll, I'll leave that to other people uh, better than me to help out with that process. I just want to get people uh, inspired to, to, to do something. Yeah, this has happened. There's, there's no doubt about it that the half baked, you know, does, a game has been published. But the fact of the matter is that right from the beginning, I said, you know, hey, this is going to create a partial game. It's going to, you know, a, a, an idea, a part of a game, a, a route from which maybe you can develop a full game, but you're not going to have a, you know, something publishable. The people ask that question. Do you think you're going to have something that's publishable after a week? And no, no possible way. It is not going to happen. Yeah. Um, so I anybody. Put that Anybody who did do that after the fact, you know, wasn't listening to the common sense. Uh, we, we, in fact, did work with a lot of the people after those, uh, after the contests on particular designs to actually flesh them out into good designs and, you know, taking, you know, uh, up to a year or more later to get them down, like Ganakanak um, or whatever. Uh, I think he took like five or six years to perfect after he put that in the game contest. Mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as an example, uh, Mountain Witch was another one that you know, got really good uh, fleshing out and testing and, and you know, all the things that it should get done. So um, the, the other thing is people were doing this anyway. <laughs> that is to say, without game contests, people were producing games very quickly and uh, publishing them. And I think uh, in a large way, one of the things that actually started or created that phenomenon was a, the the print on demand and uh, the, you know this the ease of publication that uh, yeah. we were discovering at that time, and um, uh, that's not to say that the game contest couldn't have contributed to it in some way. Somebody might have gotten the idea that hey, okay, I've you know you know seem to get have gotten good feedback, so I can just publish this. But um, we, uh, I at least felt that we did uh, as good as we could in trying to explain to people that hey, this is not going to result in publishable games right off the bat. Yeah. Um, to the second part of the question, shouldn't we be making contests that make the hard part easier? Well, sure, and if somebody comes up with a way to do that for a contest, I'm all in. <laughs> How about you, Emily? How many people have, um, have, have you seen published, or at least try to publish, or at least uh, talk about uh, publishing uh, games that, in contests that you ran? Um, there were several that were immediately after the solitaire challenge that were um, brushed up and then published and I think most of them are ones that are either um, shorter form or um, there's something that people wanted people to have for free it wasn't something that they were gonna maybe publish and, and sell um, and actually just today I posted on Google Plus a question to follow up with uh, folks who had taken part that I was in touch with to have them send me links for wherever the stage of the game is now because at the the site we have a page where we I wanted to just put updates you know what what where has the game gone what's it been some are published and some are you know just a, a PDF um, for people to download, but it's good to have. It's nice to be able to have that kind of follow up a couple years later. Yeah, the, um, the, oh yeah, go ahead. That reminds me of a, of a related issue too. We were, I was specifically accused of having, especially since the first game contest was Gamist. Um, the games that were produced for it were uh, many of them like board games, in fact, um, in a lot of different ways. And so um, the term parlor game got coined. Um, meaning a game that's really not a role-playing game so much as uh, pass the stick and talk. Yeah. Yeah. Right. More, something more like a board game which ha involves some role-play elements tacked on top. Ah, oh, that too. Yeah. Oh boy, we're getting into really contentious territory, aren't we? What's a yeah, role-playing exactly. game? Damn. <laughs> right. What, right. Right. Then right. What's a role-playing game? Right. And and to me, and when people were asking that question right off the bat. Are these role-playing games that people are making? Well, frankly, I don't give a damn. Is it fun? That's all I care about, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe it's going to be, maybe it won't be. Or, you know, are we destroying role-playing games now by creating these things? It's, to me, a ridiculous question. People are still going to make traditional role-playing games and whatever other kinds, that sort of thing. But it, it you know, but it, it it did go off in that direction somewhat. There were these other sort of new kinds of games, I, I, you know. I like to think that it was a positive development in a lot of ways, but at least it was a step on uh, evolu on the evolution. Uh, I think, right? Uh, it was we challenging. Had, we had, yeah, 
you're mm -hmm. challenging people to think out of their normal ways of thinking, and, and you are getting, you know, people got new answers for what, what they, a game could be. Right. It, was, it was fairly interesting. I think it was actually around Mike's contests, uh, in fact, where uh, Paul had published My Life with Master, and then like the next year's design contest, I saw a lot of people with games where there was scenes and you roll a die at the end of the scene, and and people, and that was where the thing uh, came out with with parlor games where you're rolling dice and moving things, and then uh, oh well, yeah, now step we have to step three A we have to role play, uh, but you could have <laughs> played the game without any role playing at all. That was a, that was a challenge that came up, and it was something that. We recognized and got over. Another one was Paths of Stick Games uh, that came out after um, uh, the, the Primetime Adventures. Uh, someone speaks and then the next person speaks. Um, the Primetime Adventures wasn't guilty of that, but it just created a wave where people wanted that sort of experience and, and, and the games sort of merged where um, uh, sort of a, 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 a role-playing game where you know there was a mechanic to determine who spoke or who, 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 who uh, said what the consequences were or whatever. Uh, then we had the whole task task versus uh, uh, conflict, you know. Yeah, and we, we saw it in waves, like like almost every year. It's like this was the year of parlor narration. This was the year of pass the stick. This was the year of conflict uh, resolution. It was, uh, you know, better, better, worse. And we saw and, these things as evolutionary. Yeah. Right, and and uh, so they were reflecting what was going on as as. as design culture in general, and that can't really be surprising to anybody that people wanted to try these things out for themselves. Um, but people would point to it and say, oh, it's the contest is causing the wave. Mm. Uh, you know, I think the, co the contests were reflecting the wave more than anything else. That's a zeitgeist. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a couple of comments um, to follow up about the question that Ralph raised about Absolutely. What do we do for the the that, that those other stages of the yeah. development process? Um, there's a, a couple of contests that sort of work in that uh, are more in that vein. Um, well, I'd like but, to interject that out of all of us, Emily's the one who's actually published the most games, so we should actually <laughs> really carefully listening to her guys. All right, so uh, all right, sorry. You're sweet. Thank you. No, you guys are amazing. Um, uh, well, one I was thinking of anyway was um, uh, there's a a, a, con a convention in Denmark called Fastball. And every year they ask for submissions, and that is a a, a, a contest, you know, sort of. Um, they uh, screen them beforehand. Some are rejected, and um, they're written specifically to be handed off to other people to run. So there's an element of meeting to communicate and the presentation. So it really has to be kind of polished in a way that the games in the contest that we're talking about don't need to be. You know, you, there's there's plenty of room for polish later on with these. Whereas this one, they're going to be played at this convention by a whole mess of folks who are going to then talk about it and judge it. There's a feedback form that all of the players fill out, which is really, really interesting and great to get back that feedback as a designer. Um, and then there's also a crew of judges who pretty much sequester themselves for the length of this con, mm -hmm. reading all these bloody games. I think they've started beforehand, and then judging them. And then there's like an Oscars award ceremony during it at this fancy dress dinner that everybody wow. goes to. Anybody out there is not aware the Scandinavians are hardcore. <laughs> yeah, they're into really, it. Yeah. And it's uh, dark a lot of, time of the year there. I think girls <laughs> really like fit a niche. Wow. <laughs> Um, so the the effect that this has had, and they specifically did this for this reason, was to really raise the bar for the kinds of games that people were presenting. And um, people are, you know, really like innovation. They really want to see new things. Um, they embrace new things, and also they they kind of push it as far as topic matter. You know, some of the games are silly. Some of the games are intensely serious, and that's that's part of their overall play culture as well. Mm -hmm. But um, but it's just an interesting model. And some of us are thinking about. Um, we like this type of games. We're thinking about doing something similar to encourage people over here to write American freeform. They're, they have Nordic freeform. Or, you know, there's a lot of different you know, tabletop and live freeform that's happening. So we'd love to encourage that too. So we might do something similar. And it's a big question. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to just talk about as far as helping at the end or the later stages of design, um, here in Western Mass, we have got a bunch of folks who design. And it's a really, really? great opportunity. <laughs> Yeah, there was a while where like five of us lived on one street, so I always said if a, <laughs> if a bomb dropped on um, that, it would be a sizable chunk of the indie game community just gone. Um, I live in the same town as some of the others, but I'm on the other side of town, so you know, they, wow. they need two bombs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, but what we did uh, last year at a, a local um, community center that was that does a lot of gaming and, and various creative tasks, we did a, um, a role-playing game design uh, series of workshops, and uh, Epidai Ravishal, uh, my husband and I hosted it, and basically we had everybody you know sign up to bring a game idea that they were already working on, or that they were just at the beginning. But almost everybody had one that they'd been working on for quite a while. And we worked with a structure where it was like a, a creative writing group, where everybody um, had one week where their game was going to be looked at and critiqued and worked on with the other participants. And then the rest of the time that we met, it was like six or eight weeks over a course of several months, um, we all committed to do that for each other's games. Um, and then we had little small groups that we'd meet with at the beginning just to sort of check in with everybody to, you know, talk generally about how game design was going. And it was really challenging from an organizer's perspective. It really made me um, uh, have a great um, appreciation for how hard a task it is to support people at this stage in some kind of structured way. Because really, like, it seemed like such a pitiful amount of time that we devoted to each game, you know, like a few mm -hmm. hours a few short hours when honestly I mean when you're writing these things you're spending 24 hours at a time thinking about it you're staying up all night talking with friends and writing and you know like it just and you, over years so yeah. it seemed like a very small amount of time and people said they got a lot out of it so I hope I hope that was helpful but um, I think it's an interesting thing to keep working with and keep uh, trying to find models where we can help each other yeah they have a similar uh, contest in, or similar Activity, I think it's called Game Storm or something like that. Game storming. It's in in the video game community, where uh, for like one weekend all over the world for in one weekend, uh, one of my friends from Japan went to Australia to do it. Uh, and it's trying to set it up in Japan, and and they have it in in like two places in the U.S. You can do it anywhere, but like there's places sort of like contest centers that are doing it, where you go in. You know, I'm a programmer. This person over here, I'm a graphic designer. Cool. They they get into groups and then they meet and then they do this for one weekend. But with a video game. You can create a small video game in like you know a few days like that uh, wow. uh, with with RPGs, uh, you know tabletop games and stuff like that. Uh, it's uh, there's it's a lot more writing involved. You know, yeah. it's it it's really takes a lot more reading, more writing, more cooperation, uh, more hand holding. Uh, since they're words, uh, you have to re you know you have to understand people's uh, feelings and work with those feelings a lot more. Uh, than just managing how high the Mega Man is jumping when you hit the button. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's a very interesting challenge. I'm glad you guys are taking up that. that I'd love to hear how that turns out at, if yeah. if anything comes out of that. I, I'd like to write up just a document. I I think I made some notes at the time to share because I think it'd be a, an interesting model for other people to experiment with. And I actually had a, a footnote that I wanted to that that what you said just now, Andy, really makes me uh, think of um, before Mike when you're saying you really can't write a game in this time period. And I, I, I mostly agree. And I think really depends on the, the scope of the game. But um, Epi and some other friends did this thing where they did a game in a jiffy, which was right before our, our local con. And they made a game in a week. But they did exactly what you were talking about, Andy, where they had a team. You know, like mm -hmm. one person made sure they were in charge of the writing. One person was in charge of the layout and so on. And everybody worked together. And actually, I took part in one, too. Um, at, for a few days to do the design process and to play storm it is what they call it um, and uh, trial and terror is a game that came out of that which was is a great game it's a small short little game but it's complete and it's done it's on the internet and uh, monkey dome is another one that we did that way and that one um, has spawned a game that Epi is writing called um, uh, um, swords of that master um, so it, I think it can be done, but I think it's really good to not raise the expectation that it will be done alone, on your own, especially if it's your first time. Yeah. It's really different when you've got a team of people you know you can work with and you have this goal to write something that's got a scope that you can handle. Um, but yeah, that's neat that they're doing that in the, the, gaming world, the video gaming world too. Cool. Very cool. Uh, we've got a question from Jason Morningstar here. <clears throat> Yeah, it's going to be hard. All right, all right, let's get serious I had here. to look up one of the words, I'm just saying. <laughs> <clears throat> contests, contests engage with and reward particular personality traits, including competitiveness and a comfort with being outgoing. How can we build contests that appeal to people who don't share these traits? And then, how do you fairly evaluate a performative medium using only text? 
This is a John Stravopoulos question. I know he's out there. He wrote that, didn't he? That's actually, <laughs> that's actually, is that's, Jason that's, that's, that's John's his, puppet now? No way. <laughs> that's his bailiwick uh, and, 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 and a wonderful person that thinks oh, about people right. all the time, uh, how personal tra yeah. personality traits uh, can help and hinder people's involvement in the contest, uh, how things like sex and race can in, uh, uh, really reflect on how people uh, uh, participate in and take away from a contest. Um, I'll 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 hold back for now. What do you guys say? What do you think, Mike? You know, I wouldn't have quit if I had all the answers. <laughs> 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 you know, uh, I, I, it, I think there's lots of room to develop these, you know, into new areas, new ideas, and stuff like that. But uh, I'm just waiting to see what uh, some other people come up with. And I'm glad to hear the one responder who you had uh, heard from saying that they're interested in actually trying to start up a, a, a game design thing themselves because, you know, somebody else will probably come up with these answers. I'll, I'll go next. Yeah. Um, I think it's good that we have different contests right now because I think it is a really good uh, point that people will respond to and be able to participate in different ways. Because I think, for example, the 24-hour contest, it's not one that happens at a specific time. You pick your own 24 hours. Yep, you do it whenever you want to, yeah. And, I mean, 24 hours might be too short for, somebody, from, for one person, but that might be the right way to do it so that somebody doesn't have to feel pressured to do it under the spotlight which is something that happens with a lot of contests. Also, if they're very introverted, uh, they don't have to participate in, a, in sort of a grand display with other people. Uh, that, very simply, a lot of times it's just a logistical problem. There are people like, well, I would have loved to do it, but I'm on vacation or I'm out of the country or whatever. Yeah. So. Yeah. Or I dare live in Australia uh, or Asia, <laughs> <laughs> where it's a day ahead, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and actually, probably that's a good point, too, is that... Um, you know, it might be that different types of contests, if they're go if that's the right answer for people to keep, you know, learning to, to um, or being inspired to write games, need to f have different parameters, and they'll they'll be started by maybe people who have different needs or are part of different communities or are participating in gaming in a different way. So it might be that um, it we need to have more people doing it so that we can get different ways of doing it. Yeah, I think so too. The uh, the so in other words, the answer to the first part of this question: How can we build contests that appeal to people who don't share those traits? More contests. Uh, <laughs> the, the Game Chef one has traditionally been something that, uh, I mean, I'll be realistic. We're we're all pretty much introverts, right? I mean, we we might have extroverted traits here and there, but we wouldn't have we would you know, we're we're in this hobby because usually we have a lot of introverted traits. Um, uh, so that's one thing we share, and yet these contests sort of build off a whole, you have to be comfortable with giving other people feedback. You have to be comfortable with accepting feedback. You have to be comfortable with uh, participating in a little bit of grandstanding, uh, perhaps a little trash talk before and after, just friendly, friendly, of course. Um, <clears throat> that's what the Game Chef Undermine was, uh, and yet I still kept that 24-hour RPG contest going for the people who just wanted to be by themselves, had something in their mind they wanted to get out, uh, didn't want a big pile of you know messy feedback. They just wanted something. They w they wanted a spark of inspiration. Um, and yeah, I think Emily's answer is the best one. Um, how do we build contests that appeal to people who don't share these traits? Think about it. Think about what traits you want to have in your contest. The the look at the rules of your contest. Think about what traits will uh, succeed more or at least have an advantage in this contest. Um, instead of smashing them all out and turning into a gray paste, just understand it, recognize it, and move on, um, and, uh, and try, to do, try to do something new. Uh, yeah. If someone uh, thinks that the traits that you establish in your contests are incorrect or, or just not very good for them, um, hopefully, I'm not saying that they'll make their own, but maybe, maybe they'll inspire someone else to make, make another one. And there are, I mean, I think it's good, too, to realize that you don't have to do it on a huge scale, um, or there can be different scales. You know, I think Ben Lehman did one a couple of years back that the theme was games about love, and just a handful of us responded, but it was like a nice, meditative, thoughtful one. Mendel's doing one right now, the, the longest um, game, shortest month. That's It's about a concern that he's interested in, about seeing longer games. And, uh, and Ron does the Ronnies. You know, so every... There's, there's many different ways that you can do this, and people do them for different reasons. So probably if people keep coming from that personal place... Recently, you know, um, 
we uh, J Jonathan Walton ran a thing called uh, Whale Chef, where you uh, where yeah. people, yes. people made people made other people's white whales. The games that they couldn't uh, they they they'd never been able to finish themselves. Everybody picked up somebody else's white whale and finished it for them, which was uh, pretty brilliant. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Yeah, I, I can't say enough about Jonathan Walton. Uh, he, he inspires me in other ways, too. Um, the other thing, I'd, uh, it sounds like we're having a big love-in for all these people that, that, that people Yay. listening might not understand. Uh, who, who is this? Who is Jonathan? Who is, who is John Stavropoulos? Who's, um, but uh, uh, one of the things that, one of my things with Jonathan is, is that um, we were talking before about making, uh, rushing to publish and things like that. Um, he uh, He's one that, um, uh, and, and Emily had a really good response to that, which is you know, a lot of people are publishing and then she mentioned they're publishing them for free. And we sort of have a media trigger when we say publish, we mean put it on IPR, get money for it, go to convention, sell your book, blah, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, public capital P publishing can be creating a, a creating an electronically or, or whatever and, and, and just leaving it out there for people and saying, I'm done with this. That is, that is true publishing. Uh, Jonathan sort of inspires me in that regards because he's always aiming to keep things uh, free to sort of uh, kind of hammer at the, at the idea that uh, the only things worthwhile are those that we end up selling to other people. Uh, the only uh, measure of success in our community is how many copies you've sold and how many, uh, uh, how, you know, how that sort of thing. Um, uh, if I want to succeed and if I want to be recognized, I should sell my thing. Uh, I think that's, uh, the part of me says, you know, I recognize that, you know, Vincent has awesome high numbers, but uh, at the same time, I also think that, you know, uh, that other people, uh, or, or that, that um, you know, sometimes money's a little unclean, and, and I just like the idea of, 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 of you know, art for art's sake, uh, yeah. publishing and getting out to people and not worrying about how much you collect off of it. Yeah, you know, sometimes, it, you know, it might have taken you a whole lot of effort to put a particular game out there, but if one group plays it once and they have fun, for me, I don't know. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I always like that. And uh, it, this actually goes back to something from the previous uh, uh, panel uh, that they were talking about earlier this evening, that uh, games are kind of heading off that direction a little bit, where it isn't the, right, the traditional publishing model uh, of getting a game out there. They were talking about Apocalypse World and Dungeon World and, and uh, the communities that are surrounding those games and how the game becomes a sort of living thing once it hits the ground and it just develops on its own into all kinds of different directions. Yep. Um, that's the thing about uh, role-playing games. Anybody who's creative enough to play role-playing games and run a role-playing game is probably creative enough to make a role-playing game at some point in time, and most of us have. And um, and thinking about it as, as, as though it's... Um, designers versus players is just, it, it never was true really. And it's less and less true all the time. Yeah. And now we're getting to the point where, you know, you know, everybody should have a dozen role playing games published out there and, and uh, maybe nobody ever plays them, but maybe somebody stops by and picks up one idea from that and pulls it out and uses it in their role playing game yeah. you know, down the road. All good. And as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah. All right. Well, we have, uh, We've come up to our hour, and we will go ahead and, and bring this wonderful panel to a close. Uh, once again, a reminder for anybody who joined late, this was a panel about game design contest. Ready, set, make a game. And big thanks to Mike, Emily, and Andy for coming on. Thank you all for coming on the panel. Thank, Thank you, guys. Rich. Thanks. Great and to see you guys. Great to talk to you, too. Again, this is uh, from Indie Plus, and this is the Pound Game Night. If you're watching the YouTube channel, we do have comments open. I know, we're crazy. But please give us feedback and let us know what else you'd like to hear in future Pound Game Nights. I love have reading night. YouTube feedback. I'll, uh, I do too. It's, it's, always, it's always helpful. <laughs> great. Well, thank you, everyone, and have a great night. Thanks, guys. Good night.